When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of bedelium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in meals or beat it in a mortar or baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou should say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle uh, of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the Spirit which is upon me, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of, thy, of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Pray with me. Most Holy Father, we confess once again this morning that we are an ungrateful and unthankful, stammering, murmuring <laughs> people, that we recognize not the great riches of your blessings toward us, that we, like those who walked before us in the wilderness, also grumble over the great gifts that you've given us, wishing that they were others. So, Father, this morning I pray that our hearts would be broken before you to see the greatness of your provision, the greatness of your sovereign love toward us, and that we might recognize your great mercies and grace upon us, that we might follow in the footsteps of our forebears who are faithful, not this wicked generation who perished in the wilderness. God, may we not be like them, but may we hear your words this morning and be encouraged to follow in the true faith of Jesus Christ, who is our way who is our truth, and who is our light. God, may we be conformed that his light may light our path, and that we may walk in your ways all our days, and that we might have satisfaction in our souls of the deepest extent. God, I pray that you would get me out of the way of your word this morning, that this people may hear what you have to say. Father, may you speak this morning, and may we obey, and may we be encouraged and satisfied in you alone. I pray this in the name of our great Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So this morning, my objective is to encourage us. Oh, good to see you make it, Packham family. <laughs> Lost keys are never fun on the Lord's Day. So, <laughs> 
My encouragement to you this morning is that we might find satisfaction and contentedness in Christ and in Christ alone. And that, that is a twofold uh, operation. In the one sense, this is something that is spiritual in nature, yes, yes and amen, and that we have true salvation in Jesus Christ alone, that God has met our need for a Savior. But we also have a temptation to become completely uh, spiritual in nature, that we've sort of discredited the actual physical needs and provisions of God. Uh, and I believe it's absolutely vital that we recognize that every good gift that we have comes from the Father above. And that includes the food on your table, the, the ableness of your body to walk and to move and to do work that you might earn to provide for your family. I appreciated the prayer of thankfulness this morning. Thank you. Uh, that, that we have this recognition that it is at God's great grace and mercy toward us that we are even able to do the things we need to do to survive. And we believe that we are not meant merely to survive, but to thrive as God's people, as God's kingdom, as God's tangible hands touching this earth, advancing the gospel, bringing it forth. And so my, my hope this morning is that we will see that we need not only to be content spiritually and physically in what Christ has done for us, but we also need to cease from murmuring and complaining and thinking that we've always had it better before, or that perhaps better days were behind us rather than in front of us. And especially in our current economic and political climate, it's very tempting for us to, to long for the glory days. And for some of us, that might be the 1980s and good old Reagan. And some of us, we might think a little further back to the, maybe the founding of our country and the Puritans. But beyond that, we need to have the vision of Christ that he set forth for his disciples. The very same vision that transformed the world that we know. What, whatever happens to our country, whatever is in God's divine providential plan for our nation, has little to do with our daily obedience. Our daily obedience, in fact, is what God will utilize to either bring about restoration or a new birth for every nation. It's the same truth that has been told all throughout church history, all the way back. I mean, what, who is Israel? What is Israel that they should be considered by God anything special? Abraham pulled out of the wilderness, sent as a missionary to a completely different ethnic tribe. Jacob, for goodness sake, Israel himself who is he but a mere man who strove against God and failed mightily, right? We are nothing special. We aren't, other than the fact that God has placed his mercy upon us and made us a people who were once not a people, made us to walk in light who were once walking in darkness. And if we recognize those things, as we walk forward in life, doing our daily tasks, our daily things of providing for our family, of caring for the fear and admonition of the Lord to be effective in the raising of our children, covering our wives in the word, ladies, loving your husbands well, loving your children well, these daily tasks are accomplished when we have satisfaction in Christ and contentedness in his provision and his hand for us at such a greater extent. We will be much more effective as God's people if we have satisfaction in the very mission that he has given us. If we find ourselves waking up every morning thinking, this is what the Lord has made me for today. If we stop thinking as men, oh, today I have to go do this. Yes, you do. And do it gladly. Because you are the one that God has appointed, brought to live, to breathe air this very day, to provide for your family. And without you, your family would suffer. Don't believe the lies of our culture that fathers are indispensable and interchangeable with other various fake gendered identities, whatever you want to call them. At the end of the day, God's design is for us as men to go and provide, to work hard. And there will be seasons of trials, brothers and sisters. There will be seasons where we feel that we are inadequate. And that is a gift of God. A gift of God. So as we look at this passage this morning, I want us to have that firmly in mind. Is that we ought not to be rebelling against the providential hand of God in our life. Oftentimes he delivers us from one trial to only give us a greater trial. I used this story recently at work. If you're familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, the horse and his boy. Uh, great little side story in that series. But if you're familiar with the characters in this story, uh, Shasta has uh, finally escaped the, the, the land of his uh, exile, so to speak, where he was held captive his entire life. And he finally makes it almost into Archenland, and he has a, a lion chasing him. And if you haven't read this book, 
sorry, you should have read it by now, so spoiler. But, uh, but he finally makes it in. They're being chased by a lion, and ultimately the girl he's traveling with, Erebus, ends up injured, mostly because of his cowardice and mostly because of his grumbling. And he arrives at this hermit's hut, and he thinks, I'm finally going to lay down and I'm going to rest. And he's feeling pretty sorry for himself because Erebus is all scratched up and injured. And the hermit tells him, get up. Run to King Loon right now in Archerland. If you go now, if you go now, you still have a chance. You can get there before the army invades and you can warn them. And Shasta's first response, of course, is to jump up and run. No, he grumbles. He does what all of us are so tempted to do. To complain. To think, why? Why me? I, just, I finally did a great thing. Let me just rest. And the hermit gives him a very wise encouragement and says that oftentimes the reward for completing a difficult task is to be given a greater and more, more difficult task. And that is oftentimes how God operates in our lives. He operates in our lives by, by excising sin from our lives only to reveal more. By giving us the, the gift and challenge of having to figure out what this marriage thing is all about. Only then to give us children and make us feel inadequate all over again. Right? Daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And yet God satisfies our need by providing everything that we need from him in his word and in the community of Christ that he has granted to us as a blessing. So this morning I hope to encourage you. I also hope to warn you to not be like our forebears in Israel who were slain in the wilderness as we read in 1 Corinthians this morning. They perished for their unbelief and their murmuring hearts, their discontented, dissatisfied, complaining hearts. And we know, as the New Testament teaches us, and as our Lord teaches us, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this morning, if you find yourself tempted to complain, if you find yourself tempted to, to murmur against God, who gives you breath as you sit here before me, I'd encourage you and warn you to think twice, and to rather be thankful to rather show gratitude. You could be sitting somewhere on the other side of the world, hopelessly, hopelessly led astray by a false god in some culture that knows Christ not. And yet by God's providential hand, he has made you holy, born into this place, into this time, that you might be set apart to hear the word of God, to be given the gift of the gospel, and by God's grace to be brought together, knit together as a family in God. So let us remember this daily and walk in it. The, the book of Numbers is an interesting book. Oftentimes we, we look at the Pentateuch and everyone's cool with Genesis, Exodus. We're like, all right. And then we get to Leviticus, Numbers, and everyone like loses their mind and quits trying. Uh, I hope that's not true of this body, but it's been my experience in my own life in the past and in many I've known. And that's unfortunate because there is great riches in the book of Numbers and in the book of Leviticus. Uh, and Deuteronomy might be one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, it's absolutely rich of God's blessing and God's purpose and God's saving hand time and time again. And this passage in Numbers 11 begins uh, sort of several <laughs> problems. When we think of Israel in the wilderness, we don't typically think of them as a model of faithfulness and trust. We tend to think about how much they complain. Is that not true? And so Numbers 11 through, uh, through I believe it's Numbers 22, we see several complainings. We see it here in 11.1 in and 11.4. It says, When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the, fear of the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Uh, and in 11.4 it says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? They're not satisfied with the manna. They want flesh now. In 12, uh, verse 1, it says, And Miriam and Owen, uh, Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they're complaining again. Chapter 14, we hear again, And all the congregation lift up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we would have died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? They're asking for death. One of my favorite stories in scripture then, in, in uh, Numbers chapter 16, we have Korah's rebellion. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, the son of Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. 
And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And we know what happens to them. One of the coolest things in Scripture, the, the God opens up the ground and swallows them and takes them down alive into Sheol. That warrants, I think, a further study. And it's a fascinating picture. <laughs> down alive into Sheol. 1641 then goes on, But on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. So now uh, Korah's people have been swallowed up, and then they complain. You killed them. What's up? Chapter 20, verse 3 says, And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we have died with our brethren died before the Lord. Again, man, it would be better if we just died than if we were wandering out here well fed, well watered, in, you know, temple sacrifice worship in the tabernacle. No, no, that's not good enough. It would be better if we died. And then finally, 21, verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. You see the conflict there. There's no bread, except for this bread, right? Even the bread that God supplies isn't bread enough for them, right? How often do we do the same thing, though? And so we see these sort of seven uh, articulations here in the, in the middle of the book of Numbers. And we see time and time again that same word. And they complained and they murmured against God. Mind you that if we flash back, uh, you know, to the book of Exodus, what are they doing in Egypt? God, we have no straw. We have no mud. Save us. So God saves them. Why did you save us, God? Right? This is what we do. We oftentimes complain. And then God delivers it from us. And then we complain about the way in which God delivered us. Right? <laughs> God, I just wish I had a job so I could pay for this or do this. Not that job, God. That job's terrible. Right? We are constantly dissatisfied. God, I wish I had some food to eat, and I wish we could, oh, man, I just wish we had steak tonight instead of, you know, chicken again. Yeah, okay, um, it's not soybeans, guys. Let's, let's, you know, let's be content, maybe. And if you're eating soybeans, we'll talk about that later. But uh, <laughs> uh, tofu is an abomination. Moving on, okay. Uh, <laughs> if you like tofu, I still love you. Okay. Uh, there's a few things I want us to see in this passage, particularly in Numbers 11, though. First and foremost, complaining against a holy God deserves wrath. Verse 1 says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. Just a little bit. And the Lord heard it, and the anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them. They were in the uttermost part of the camp. Praise be to God that he doesn't deal with us the way that he once dealt with Israel. But I say that with the caveat that he does still judge. He does still discipline. He does still punish. He does still bring the rod upon our back sometimes. Because a haughty and arrogant and unquieted spirit, one that complains and murmurs against God, oftentimes the greatest gift that God can give us is hard times. When my wife and I were first married, I, uh, we got married, I was 19, she was 18. You know, the whole bridal college I proposed by spring, you know, didn't get my money back, that thing, right? Uh, we, we got married, and I had an internship lined up. We are going to move into married student housing at our Bible college. Everything seemed like it was good to go. And I come back from our honeymoon. We go to the church and that Sunday morning, and the pastor who had offered me the internship is preaching his final sermon. And I guess it was his last day, and I had no idea. Uh, and through a series of events, uh, long story short, we ended up having to leave school. We moved to Eastern Oregon, uh, where I was going to go intern as a, as a middle school pastor at a church. And we lived in about, what, a 16-foot camp trailer? Something like that? I don't know. February, March, middle of, you know, end of the winter, it's maybe 20 degrees outside. We, haven't, we had enough money to keep enough propane to set it at about 50 degrees. And we had white bread and mustard for about three months. And that was the best gift that God could have ever given our marriage. I'll tell you what, when you're stuck in a little box where the only way to keep warm is to actually snuggle with your, other, with your partner, with your wife or husband, uh, that is a quick way to get over whatever issues you were having and trying to work out in the first, oh, I don't know, eight months of your marriage. <laughs> but those hardships were a gift. They were a gift that taught us to be content, to not, to not grumble. And, and I'd like to say that it taught us perfectly not to grumble, and that, that would be a lie. Because then we moved into uh, an apartment 
next to a meth lab. <laughs> and we're like, well, this is great. This is better. Had no AC. It was the upstairs with some house. Things weren't great there either. And then we moved into a little bit better house. And then we moved to Idaho. And then we bought a home. And, and many of you have been to my house out, out there. And it's, it's not perfect. And there's lots of weeds. But we have so much. So much to be thankful for now. And this has been God's providence towards us. We're not rich by any means. But God has richly blessed us. And for me to think back to a 16-foot camp trailer with no children and think that that was where my humble origins began in my family story, so to speak, really gives me pause. Really gives me pause. And I imagine each of you have a similar story in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's living with a bunch of dudes uh, at some college <laughs> dorm apartment or whatever it may be. Thinking back about it, it might not be your, your physical providence, your phys physical provisions that was mi minimal, but perhaps for many of you it was your spiritual provision. You didn't grow up in the church. You didn't know the light of the gospel. Many of you are perhaps still haunted by the sins of your youth. That you continue to think back to all the stupid things that you did before the gospel was made known in your heart. And that the doctrines of grace illuminated you through the Holy Spirit to see the providential hand of God in your life. But ours is not to think about what was other than to admit that God did something through that to bring us to today. Because so often we think of our past as something that we regret Nothing is regrettable when we believe in a sovereign God who ordains every word, thought, and deed, who oversees and handles every breath that you take. Yes, it's lamentable perhaps, but not regrettable because we can see what God was doing. In family worship recently, we've been committing as a family the Heidelberg question number one to memory. And one of the lines says, what is your comfort in life and death, right? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and set me free, and we always have to say with a Scottish accent, from the tyranny of the devil. I don't know, it just feels right. But then it says, he also watches over me in such a way that not a hair, which is ironic with me, I know, but not a hair from my head can fall without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. All things. That is the love of your Savior, the love of your Father, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, that He is working all things together for your salvation. Why? Because He wants to. Because of you? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Not because of us. <laughs> because He wants to. When we complain against a holy God, when we look to God who has provided for us, who has set us free from sin, death, the tyranny of the devil, and when we look at him and complain, that deserves nothing but wrath. And praise be to God that we have been born into the new covenant, that we might have a righteous mediator that satisfies God's wrath on our behalf. That doesn't mean that God won't discipline. God might even take your life. <laughs> but if he does, that is a gift to you. We also see a beautiful picture here in verses 2 and 3. The people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tibera because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. We see that God has always used intercessors. God spoke through his prophets, through his judges, through his kings. He raised up men to oversee and to intercede for God's people. Oftentimes, I was raised Arminian. So we'd read passages like this, and I'm like, I'm so thankful that Moses convinced God to change his mind. That's silly. Uh, <laughs> but God's chosen means of bringing his people into right relationship with himself has always been through intercessory people. And this is a beautiful shadow, a beautiful foretype of Christ himself, who is our intercessor, who is our mediator between God and man. And if Jesus stands before us and between us and God, then we can stand with straight knees, not drooping, lifting our hands in right worship to the God of Jacob because Jesus has made us right before God. We need an intercessor. We have an intercessor. And the fires of God have been quenched in the cross of Christ. And we praise him for that. But you see very quickly... Things have already calmed down. God, God just kills some people. He just drops fire on people. And mind you, that they've been going with a pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. Everything looks great, you know. 
And then God just decides to bring the pillar down instead of in the tabernacle, right up in the camp and just take people out. Moses prays, God relinquishes his judgment, and they should be content, satisfied, thankful, praise be to God, worshiping, sorry for our foolishness, God. Let's see. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? And all the way on through verse 9, they complain. They complain again, further discont dis uh, discontentedness. They're not satisfied with the provision of God. Back in Exodus 16, 13, it says, And it came to pass that at evening the quails came up, ironic, we'll find out, and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay around uh, about the hosts. And then Deuteronomy 12, 20 tells us, When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border, as he hath promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh. Thou mayest eat flesh, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. <clears throat> this is a reflection of proper worship. Okay, what's interesting here is that the God provides them in Exodus this account. They're, they're saying, what will we eat while we're out here in the wilderness? They're looking around. There's not exactly game and plants and things to harvest. Uh, so what are we going to do, God? So God provides them water. So God provides them bread, manna in the wilderness. And not only that, but he provided them quail, that first, first meal, which is interesting that they are then dissatisfied with God's provision. Now, I can kind of relate to this. I get this. There has been plenty of times in my life where my diet consisted of top ramen and hard-boiled eggs, uh, at least early on in my life. <laughs> Praise be to God for my lovely wife, <laughs> uh, who makes good things to eat. But, but there is something to be said about having a repetitive, bland diet and how that will become frustrating. God has created our bodies not only to desire and to need different types of good things, but also just to worship God through enjoying his good gifts. The fact that we have, uh, you know, coffee and meat and vegetables and fruit mm -hmm. and sugar in, in, in modesty, hopefully, uh, and good, good drinks to drink. The fact that we have wine and bread to partake of here later this morning as an example of, of the meal and provision of God that we have in Christ for all eternity. God wants us to enjoy the good gifts of his creation. But at the same point, he also wants us to be satisfied when he withholds some of those good gifts from us. So we see that manna was instituted to save them through the wilderness, to bring them safely into the land of promise. And we know the rest of the story that they would have been brought providentially into the land had they only had faith. Because that is the other component this morning we need to consider. The discont discontentedness, murmuring and complaining are examples of a lack of faith. They are a lack of trust in a most holy God. We, we, we laugh at the Israelites. God brings them out of Egypt, out of their oppression under Pharaoh, through these mighty signs and wonders, the plagues and the Passover. And then they immediately complain in the wilderness and they get to the border and they say, there's giants, oh no. And they're afraid. And so God lets that entire generation pass in the desert, die away. Save Joshua and Caleb. What a silly, silly thing for them to do. And we look at that and say, oh, you foolish Israelites. And yet we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We look back at that great trial from three years ago and say, wow, God, you brought us through that great trial. And then we immediately think about the problems of today. The problems of today. My car won't start. Oh, now I have an oil leak. Oh, now I, now I have a, a jack stand I can't, can't get down, right? <laughs> Series of events. And guess what? They're just challenges for the day. And then we overcome them. And we move on. And if they overcome us, then we have a faithful Savior who will meet us in that failure. But what's interesting here is that this passage from Deuteronomy I just read is that God's intention is to give them all the good gifts. All the good gifts. He says in Deuteronomy 12.20, as I read a moment ago, You'll say, I'll eat flesh because you, saw, you long to eat flesh. Thou mayest eat flesh, whatever thy soul lusts after. Right? Whatever your soul desires, right? Good lust. 
But whatever your soul desires, go ahead. It's in worship. It's an act of worship. And they are told to go ahead and indulge, to enjoy, but merely to withhold their hand from eating blood or anything that's been strangled. There's some rules. And that's actually affirmed in Acts chapter 15. It's actually affirmed in Acts chapter 15. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than the necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. Leviticus 19.26 says, Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment, nor observe times. God's law is eternal. We see it affirmed time and time again in the Acts of the Apostles, the way that they teach, the way that they live out their life. God has very minimal restrictions, if we really think about it. Oftentimes we look at God's law and we think of it as a burden. We think of it as a yoke, too much to carry. And in one sense, absolutely, yes and amen. It condemns us of our sin. It rightly demonstrates to us that we are un incapable of rightly living before a holy God. And therefore demonstrates our need of a Savior. But at the same point, sort of this third use of the law, it's also a light to our feet. It also demonstrates that which is good that we ought to pursue in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit through sanctification. My wife and I have been working our way through holiness by J.C. Ryle. We just finished a chapter on sanctification the night before last. Goodness, I commend it to you. Very humbling, very encouraging. Very, very encouraging. But sanctification, this idea of walking in faith throughout the rest of our life, always pursuing greater and greater holiness, greater and greater contentedness in Christ, greater and greater understanding of the salvation that God has afforded us. When we walk in that sanctification, we must be marked as a people who are content and satisfied in what God has done for us. All God has prohibited from us are things that we ought to be disgusted by anyway. Everything that God has withheld from us is something that God has deemed we do not need or we ought to consider an abomination. Right? If you don't have it, I believe it's an Elizabeth Elliot quote, and I, I'll just paraphrase because I don't remember the exact quote, but, but to the extent that if you don't have something, she encourages and exhorts in one of her books, then God doesn't think you need it. Amen. What if we had that attitude? When we woke up in the morning and thought about, man, I wish I had this right now instead of that. What if we thought, well, God decided a, that's not what I need right now. What a change that would be. So the story will continue several verses later with this story of desiring meat. But as a quick aside, verses 10 through 17 has Moses grumbling himself. <laughs> Am I their dad? Did I bring them into this world? He's complaining to God saying, these are your people. Why are you making me have to deal with their stupidity? Which is ironic because Moses' own unfaithfulness withholds him from the promised land. He obviously became like the people he was irritated with rather than encouraging and leading them to do otherwise. And that is a temptation that should very much give us pause. As we read in the passage in the New Testament reading from 1 Corinthians, we need to be careful lest we fall like these who fell in the wilderness. We need to recognize as fathers that we set an example for our children and our wives. Mothers, you likewise. That you have a responsibility to demonstrate what faithfulness and contentedness and joy looks like. If I come home from a bad day at work and my first temptation is to grumble, to complain, to think, oh, I just want to sit with some peace and quiet for a minute. If that is how I enter my household, my household will reflect my sin. So instead, if I take that minute to drive home, to talk to my wife, to be encouraged, to pray, to listen to a sermon, maybe, whatever it may be, if you have a commute, redeem the time. Whatever it is you need to do to get your heart straight, to get your mind right before you walk in that door so that you can be a blessing to your family instead of a burden, do it. Because just as you image the Father, your children will image you. And sometimes that is God's favorite way of exposing sin in our lives. <laughs> Looking at the little mirrors of our children and thinking to ourselves, I didn't know I said that. I didn't know I did that. Oh boy. <laughs> but it also demonstrates here that even prophets need help. 
And I see a picture here, a forebear of, of the officers. It refers to these elders in Israel as officers in the, in the congregation. We see a prototype, if you will, of elders and deacons in the New Testament church. We need help. This is why a plurality of elders is basically a commandment, an expectation. A plurality of leadership is good within the body of Christ because it is not good for a man to bear that alone. It is also not good for one's arrogance to have all of that authority and power at the same time. And so we see a picture here of one, what we ought not to do. We ought not to grumble and complain and say, oh, these people, they keep calling me, they keep sinning, they keep doing stupid things. We need to not follow Moses' example there. But we also need to recognize that God has provided a system intentionally that the church might be well served. That we might have a deacon, and by God's grace, as, as the church grows, a plurality of deacons in the future. That we might have a plurality of elders. That we might have heads of household willing to step up and bear the weight and responsibility of being someone who is a member of the church. So many churches throughout the world think that all of the ministerial responsibilities rest upon the officers of the church. And nothing could be further from the truth. The officers of the church ought to be exemplary in their example to you, in their demonstration of what godly living looks like, so that you might mimic and imitate and follow. Imitate us as we imitate Paul, as Paul imitates Christ, and so on. But it also is important to recognize here that even our leadership is failing at times. We are still simul justus et peccator, simultaneously justified in a sinner. We still struggle against the flesh, the world, and the devil. And yet we know who our overcomer is, Christ. So may we continue the good work of raising up godly elders and deacons to serve the church. And may we raise up you men to take responsibility in your households, to be an encouragement to your homes, so that we might have godly wives obedient and joyful children, and blessing to come. Verses 18 through 23, they continue to demand meat. Verse 18 says, And say, say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides... But God oftentimes chastises us by giving us what we want. <laughs> Many of you have probably experienced this in your own life. That sometimes the greatest thing that we think we desire, once we have it, it becomes hollow. And if we just need a tangible example of that, all we have to do is think about the, the toys we purchase for our little ones and how quickly they become boring. And that is an example to us. It's a picture of us of our own heart. That we get that new thing and it's exciting for a few days or a few weeks or maybe, by God's grace, a few months. And then it becomes normal, ordinary. God's provision is never ordinary. It is extraordinary that we breathe air that is provided to us in an atmosphere that is sustained by our solar system and held together by the knitting work of God's sustaining force throughout the universe. There is nothing normal and boring about the world in which we live. But God delivers, and he delivers in such a way that he also uses it as a form of discipline. I just, I'm going to read this verse again because I love it. Verse 20, he says, But even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils. I, I sometimes will say things like that to my children. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. Uh, we'll give you that. <laughs> you have so much of that that you're going to hate it. <laughs> we don't want to needlessly frustrate our children, but there is a sense in which God will discipline us with the desires of our heart, which sounds contrary, but it's not. God oftentimes rec recognizes that what we need to see is that the things we love are truly idols. And that the best way to expose the idolatry of our hearts is to actually give us our idols. And then when we get our idols, we realize they're unsatisfactory. Whether that be money or possessions or the allure of some screen and some fake woman. 
Whatever it is that we pursue thinking it will satisfy, it only leaves us hungry. And so the great lesson of this passage in Scripture is that the people think they love and desire provision. But what they ought to actually desire is the provider himself. And that is the true gift of Christ in us. Is that we long for peace. We long for hope. We long for love. And what God gives us is not just those attributes separated, hanging in the ether. But he gives us the source of those attributes. Christ himself and the Holy Spirit imputing and imparting to us the good gifts of God. The fruit of the Spirit. Contentedness, kindness, self-control. These things God grants us in and of himself, not just as some sort of outside resource, but the well of life itself. These people wrongly thought that if they just had meat, they'd be happy. So skipping down to verse 31 through 33. They have satisfied bellies, but they also experienced the satisfied wrath of God. It says, And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as if it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered all the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten omers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. So, an omer is about, or a cubit is about 18 inches. That means there was approximately three feet deep of quails, a day's journey in every direction. Which, if you figure the ten omers here, did a little, did a little uh, research here. I didn't do the Bible math myself. I trusted those <laughs> who did it before me. But uh, ten omers would be about 475 pounds or the equivalent of about 1,900 quails. So the one who gathered the least gathered almost 2,000 quails. If that's not coming out your nostrils, I don't know what is. Earlier, the people complained, Moses complained, what am I supposed to do, go slaughter all the the herds to feed these hundreds of thousands of people? And yet God brings up the most massive flock of quail that the world has ever seen. (laughs) What should give us pause again, though, is that he feeds them. And then he strikes them down. Sometimes God gives us the desires of our heart only to then recognize that our desires were wrong, our desires were false, and that he might use it as an example. It says, while it was still in their teeth, the Lord and his wrath was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. God will use the very things that we long for to discipline us, to chide us, to remind us. It's like the man who foolishly goes and buys an expensive sports car, foolishly spends tons of money on this this great love of his life to the great detriment of his family and his needs and his economic welfare, only to have the engine break down a few months later and not be covered by a warranty. That's God's justice, my friends. That's God teaching us to hate our idols. And that's a very extreme example. But how many times do we do the same thing? How many times do we just go, oh, I can't wait to have that. Can't wait to have that. Can't wait to go. I mean, it's just some, something simple. Have you ever gone out to like a really expensive dinner and then you thought to yourself, man, my wife cooks better than this? And it's so dissatisfying, right? I'm blessed enough that that's unfortunately a kind of regular occurrence for me. But... <laughs> But there's a sense in which you go out and you invest. Like you actually, you, you sacrifice. If you think about it, every time we transact and purchase anything, it's a sacrifice. What we purchase is worship, in a sense. It all belongs to God. And so every time we walk out and we, we sacrifice, I, I think to myself sometimes when I go out to do things, 
I had to work six hours for that. What's crazy is when my kids start doing math and they start realizing, wow, that Lego set, I'd have to work. You know, they start doing the hours. Think about that. Think about that. So when you sacrifice for something and then it's unsatisfying, man, that, that's just rotten. It's terrible. It's like having the meat of the quail in your teeth and then God going, ha! Now, does that mean that we always desire wrongly? Not necessarily. But the brother of, of Christ, James, tells us in his epistle that we don't receive because we ask wrongly. And does that mean that the asking is sort of like magic words? No, his, his point is that the intent of our heart oftentimes is wrong. That we ask wrongly and we don't receive because we aren't actually content to receive that which God promises. And so oftentimes we are unsatisfied because we realize that we are just longing for an easy way out, longing for a cheap satisfaction, rather than longing for the good, satisfying gift of life that God, He Himself is in His very nature. So I want to give you a few points of application this morning. To reiterate, it wasn't provision they needed. It was the provider Himself. We ought to be a contented people, satisfied with Christ. Our soul longs for God and ought to find its satisfaction in God. A few verses for us to consider. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 says, uh, But godliness with contentment is, is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you take pleasure in your infirmities? Habakkuk 3, 17 and 19. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the hold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. And of course, everyone's favorite verse to quote out of context, so here's the context. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. If you want to read some sermons on that, read Jeremiah Burroughs, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. He wrote 10 sermons on that verse. There you go. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. That is the context for that verse. I can have nothing and I can continue to endure because Christ is my strength. I can have abundance and not idolize it because Christ is abundantly my strength. Luke 12, 15, the Lord said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. possesseth. Proverbs 15, 16, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And lastly, Psalm 106, 24 and 25, Yea, this is speaking of those in the wilderness. They despise the pleasant land. They believe not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Notice what David says in his psalm. They despised because they believe not his word. So what is the key for us this morning? That we would guard ourselves against murmuring hearts discontentedness, a lack of joy and trust in faith, in the sustainer of the cosmos, we must believe his word. For he has given us a promise, and he is faithful to complete the work that he has begun in each of us. That might not be to great physical and <laughs> property worth, I guess, so to speak, but it will always be enough 
When has the Lord your God failed you? Not ever, friends. When you have had want, may you say with Paul, Christ is my strength. When you have abundance, may you faithfully, charitably bless others with it and say Christ is my strength in that as well. I want to close with a couple quick quotes from that book I just referenced, uh, Jeremiah Burroughs. He says, in a clock, stop at one wheel and you stop every wheel because they are dependent upon one another. So when God has ordered a thing for the present to be thus and thus, how do you know how many things depend upon this thing? God may have some work to do 20 years hence that depends on this passage of providence that falls out this day or this week. Have you ever had your car break down on the side of the highway only to know that a couple hundred yards over that hill there was a great car accident that you would have been in? And you think to yourself, my goodness, had my God, my God not broken my car, I might have been in the middle of that wreck. How many times are we this close from jumping over the chasm into death? And God, by his grace, restrains us by afflicting us with a trial. <laughs> have we considered that? And yet not a thing happens, not a thing comes to pass, aside from the will of God. And the martyr's blood as one of the fathers said, is the seed of the church because their death was not in vain, because God intended good. And obviously, we have the great story of Joseph in the land of Egypt. That what his brothers presumed would, would be evil upon him, that would merit revenge from their brother now in high place. Joseph tells them what you meant for evil, God intended for good. That he might bring a whole generation of people into life Burroughs also says, if I become content by having my desire satisfied, that is only self-love. But when I am contented with the hand of God and am willing to be at his disposal, that comes from my love to God. In other words, don't be satisfied with the gift, but be satisfied with the gift giver. He also says, oh, that we could but convince men and women that murmuring spirit is a greater evil than any affliction whatever the affliction. And the last one for you, actually two more, because I want that one's good too. <laughs> it is but one side of a Christian to endeavor to do what pleases God. You must as well endeavor to be pleased with what God does. And lastly, if you pour a pail full of water on the floor of your house, it makes a great show. But if you throw it into the sea, there's no sign of it. So afflictions considered in themselves we think are very great. But let them be considered with the sea of God's mercies we enjoy. And then they are not so much. In fact, they are nothing in comparison. Brothers and sisters, today is a day to rejoice. For the precious blood of Jesus Christ has paid for all your sins. For you have been forgiven. For you have been justified and restored into right relationship with God through the work of the Holy Spirit, drawing your heart and faith to our blessed Savior. And He who foreknew you, who predestined you, who justified you, He will also sanctify and glorify you as adopted sons and daughters. That is great news. So today may I encourage you to be content with Christ as the source of your peace. Burroughs also has a portion in one of his sermons where he says that we quote that verse about the peace of God that transcends, that passes understanding. And we think of peace alien to God himself. It is not the peace that we desire, but God himself. And when we have God as the source of our peace, then we have true peace indeed. So brothers and sisters, take heed to what you've heard this morning. Do not leave this day dissatisfied or discontented, for God Almighty is working in you. Husbands, love your wives, love your children. Young men, be strong in your work ethic. Be an example to those around you who are likely perishing in sin. 
Be faithful members of this congregation. Be faithful members of Christ that you might witness to them. And when the Lord blesses you one day with your families, whatever that may look like, continue to take heed of this. Be satisfied with the trial you have today, whatever that may be. Wives, love your husbands. Submit to them. We're not perfect. We are not Christ. But your loving submission, even to imperfect men as us, encourages us to become more like Christ. In fact, your loving, joyful service to our households encourages us to emulate all the more the love of our Savior to you. And children, obey your parents. This is right with the Lord. Honor them as you honor God. And it will go well with you. We don't believe the prosperity gospel, but God prospers us by granting us the satisfaction of our hearts and knowing that when we obey God's law, when we love God's law, God does grant us joy, peace, hope, and yes, even oftentimes, material possessions. A man who is faithful, who loves his wife, who raises his children, is likely going to be in a better place, and his children are likely going to be in a better place. It's the one statistic that impacts the success of young people. Whether or not they had a father in the home who loved them, who cared for them, who set an example of hard work. So children, don't be dissatisfied when your fathers fail you, but encourage them, love them. We have a father who fails us not. We have a savior who works out our salvation on our behalf. And by God's Holy Spirit, He gives us the gift today to walk in faithfulness. So choose today. Will you have a murmuring heart like Israel in the wilderness? Or will you follow Jesus Christ in joyful contentedness? Knowing that neither height nor depth nor anything can separate you from His love. And that nothing can be against us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great provision. We thank you for Jesus Christ, his precious blood, for the death, burial, and resurrection. Christ, we thank you that you are seated now in the heavenly places at the right hand of God Almighty, O God, our Savior. May you rule and reign, and may you advance this kingdom. God, may we not use our contentedness as a means to be apathetic or complacent or to just sit back and let you do your thing, God. But God, rather, may our contentedness be the source and motivation that causes us to long all the more to obey your word, to walk in your steps, to follow you. So God, grant us the love of your word. May we not despise it as our forebears, but may we love your word. May we follow your word. God, I thank you for this congregation, this group of people that you have called to make your own, that you've bought with the precious blood of Christ. I pray, God, that each of us would be humbled before your mighty work, that we would declare the righteousness of Jehovah God, that we would be contented with gratitude from on high. Father, we thank you for the spiritual bread. We thank you for the physical bread. We thank you that we may sing in a moment our prayer that you have given us today our daily bread. But Christ, we know that you are eternal bread greater, greater than our daily bread. You will daily sustain us, not just in this life, but in the life to come for all eternity. And for this, we praise your holy name. God, may you receive glory and honor and dominion. And may we faithfully live out our lives daily doing the simple things, the, what we perceive to be ordinary things, that you might work extraordinarily in our lives. <clears throat> Father, we love you imperfectly as we do. We love you. Help us to love you more righteously, to love you more perfectly this day. May we encourage one another and love one another with the love that you have granted us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.